Uh, just a few housekeeping points before we kick off. The session is slightly longer than normal. It's uh, 45 minutes instead of 30 minutes. There will be time for questions at the end. Uh, so if you want to, ha if you have any questions, you can pop them in the questions box in the control panel that you can see. Um, there is a copy of the presentation in the handouts box, uh, also available through the control panel. Uh, and Tom, if you want to kick off. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Cormac. And thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us on this global Snack and Learn webinar. Um, today, we're going to be talking about a concept called Connected Sight. Um, just to put a very bit, quick bit of context around that, it's centred on the digital transformation of construction. Um, so without further ado, Cormac, if you could move to the next slide, please. Just to, as a way of introductions, um, so there's three of us presenting today. Uh, we'll each give you a quick overview of who we are in a second. Um, but we're all part of WSP's intelligent infrastructure business in the UK. And we're also part of the Smart Motorway Programme Alliance Connected Site team. Um, and we have a sort of keen interest, uh, focus and expertise in digital construction, innovation and transformation. Um, so I am Tom Grahamslaw, I'm an Associate Director within the Intelligent Infrastructure Business, um, and I'm also the Head of Connected Site within the SMP Alliance. Um, for those that aren't aware, the, the SMP Alliance is a group of designers, contractors and client organisations that are looking to deliver the future of the Smart Motorway programme in the UK. Um, it's a 10-year alliance contract. Um, that brings together uh, all parties um, to, to deliver that program uh, and other sort of improvement programs across the strategic road network in the UK. Um, so I'll hand over to Cormac. I think you're on mute, Cormac. Comic, it looks like we cannot hear you still. Apologies. Attempt three, is that coming through? Yes, thank you. That's coming through now, yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm a principal, consult yeah, principal consultant within intelligent infrastructure in WSB. Uh, I've been working in digitalization and automation within the construction industry for about five years now. Uh, I work with Tom in the Smart Motors Program Alliance as the head of connected plant and workers, looking at automate, uh, looking at innovations around those two topic areas and how we can deliver them and get them on site and, and get them out. Uh, and I've also done some work on high level strategy development for clients like National Highways and how we can sort of get broad scale rollout of this uh, across the UK. James, have you want to forward? Yeah, thanks, Cormac. Hi, everyone. I'm James Barker. I'm a senior consultant within the Intelligent Infrastructure Group within WSB in the UK. And I have the role of a delivery manager within the Connected Site team and the SMP Alliance. So looking at um, the strategic elements of understanding what we roll out, as well as the actual sort of innovation management and delivery of some of the um, connected initiatives that we've been looking at, which I'll talk a bit more about later on. Thanks very much, James. Okay, do you want to move on to the next slide, please, Cormac? Okay, so we just wanted to start by setting a little bit of context, um, introducing you to the topic area and just giving a few facts and figures that try to bring to life um, the sector that we're in, but also some of the complexities that um, the construction um, industry offers. Um, so the construction sector, as most people are aware, is a significant part of the global economy. Um, it contributes to the development, really, of the, of the built uh, environment, be it infrastructure, roads, rail, um, utility networks, all the way through to the, the buildings that we, we sleep in at night uh, and work in during the day. Um, and it's quite a, a substantial sector when you look at the um, makeup of um, individual nation states. So if we look at the UK um, as a as a perspective, the construction sector contributes to around 6% of the country's GDP um, and employs around 3 million people. Uh, just to put that into context, 
Uh, we've got around 66, 67 million people in the UK. Um, broadly half of that are working uh, population. Um, so it's quite a, a substantial amount being over, over 10% of the um, of those employed in, in the country. And the sector has quite a number of challenges, but similar to other industries um, you know we've got the drive to hit net zero um, there's a, a growing shortage in labor and there's an ever growing uh, an increase cost of of materials uh, contributed to uh, from things like covid 19 a few years ago uh, at its peak and also the uh, war in in ukraine driving a lot of that um, the challenges, however, in the construction sector are sort of exacerbated um, primarily by the sort of low productivity rates that that sector has seen compared to other industries, um, be it manufacturing, mining, agriculture, have seen quite substantial increases in productivity over the same um, time that the construction has sort of stagnated. Um, and there's a real opportunity, though, that's brought by by digital, uh, we use that banner, um, but but really things like increasing automation, um, improving efficiency through digital tools and processes, um, and it really does offer an opportunity to enhance the performance of the sector, of which connected site is a potential uh, concept that enables some of that digital transformation, really delivers that, that lasting change. Um, so just a bit of a, a scale as well, so on the right hand side there of the slide, you can see that the construction sector typically has only seen a 1% increase in labour productivity over the last two de decades, um, really not enough, um, and, and we should be seeing a much higher number there. Um, the contribution of the construction sector to global um, CO2 emissions is, is significant, um, and also there is an ongoing challenge around safety um, and the number of incidents that do occur in this particular industry comparative to um, all industries. When, when you do that comparison, it's, it's significantly higher, around three and a half times. So there is a real challenge here a need for change, um, a need to improve productivity, efficiency, uh, address the carbon challenge that we're all aware of, and also address the safety performance challenges that the sector has. If we can move on to the next slide, please, Carmack. But it's not going to be easy, um, and that's because really the the complexities of the construction sector are quite um, significant. Um, and we're seeing a number of these uh, from the work that we've we've undertaken in the UK, but conscious that um, a lot of these are, are, are sort of consistent across across the globe. So um, just drawing out a couple of the key complexities that people will be able to um, relate to and will, will probably resonate. So there is a real resistance to change in the sector. Um, the population of construction workers tends to land at the latter stages of, of, of people's careers. So we're seeing a lot of people in the sector that are hitting 50s and some, sometimes 60s. And the average age of workers is, is quite a lot higher than, than other sectors. And when you've undertaken a job for so many years um, and you've done it the same way for quite a long time, um, you can be quite a bit resistant to change. So there's a real sort of behavioural challenge that we're facing um, that adds a lot of complexity to uh, introducing new technologies, introducing innovation and new ways of working. And it's also a sector that is quite risk averse. Um, the clients are, are really pushing on um, the ability for projects to hit budgets, to hit timescales and programs. Um, and really from that, the ability to innovate, bring new ideas, take a little bit of risk to transform um, sometimes uh, isn't there. Um, and, and we see that across a number of projects, programs, be it in the UK, but also, also globally. Um, as I touched on before, there's a, a real skills and labour shortage. It's not one of the most attractive industries to come into. Um, and so trying to convey this idea of, uh, of uh, young people after school, college, university to come into the sector can be quite a difficult sell. Um, and so one of the opportunities we've got is to draw them in through use of technology, um, use of innovation. But really, we need to get that out there to demonstrate the use of it, the case studies to really excite people to come into the industry. Um, and it's also a capital intensive um, 
nature. There's a, a real complexity around this. The need for upfront investment when you're talking about quite significant changes in technology, um, new processes, new procedures, a project program, even national scales can involve quite a lot of investment. Um, and that investment really tends to need to be driven at a, at a nation state level, governments, uh, key infrastructure or client organisations to really help drive that forward. Um, and as we're aware, there's um, less and less sort of um, money around in, the, in this space. Um, and we're finding that, that governments are struggling to, to um, invest as they potentially have in the, in the past. Um, so that's just to put a little bit of complexity around the environment. I'll hand over now to, to Cormac, who will introduce the idea of the connected site and how we can address some of these problems um, through use of that concept. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I just wanted to take this moment to talk a little bit about the wider context of digitalization in the in the construction industry. So it's generally recognized that you know the problems Tom has talked about are well recognized they're well known they've been around for a while uh, and that's led to a, a sort of increased interest in what's called modern methods of construction uh, which is all about transforming how we deliver construction um, from design all the way through uh, features the use of off-site assembly and on-site innovations in this combination um, the framework that's shown below this seven stage picture was published by the uk government in 2019 and it sort of gives a good illustration of the breadth of topics included in, in MMC. Uh, and as you can see, Connected Site really is sitting at the end of that. We view uh, Connected Site as being the mechanism for delivering uh, on-site innovation and how you transform that within the sort of the wider uh, strategy that WSP launched in, in July 23 of, of how we're gonna do that. So this presentation really focuses on on-site processes. Uh, if I just go to the next slide. So this slide is trying to set out a, a very high level vision of what Connected Site is about. Um, the infographic on the on the right sort of gives a, a flavor of the different kinds of things that, are, that make it up. And you can sort of identify four pillars almost that, that make it up. So you've got the people who do the job, the workers who are, who are carrying out the construction, the plant and the tools that they use to do it. Uh, the materials that they they use when they're doing the construction, and wrapped around all of that is a big logistics and planning element about when and where things need to be and jobs need to be done. And Connected Site says that we should digitalize across the board, transform all of these, uh, and by doing so, by introducing new technologies, by using data and, and connectivity, we'll be able to increase safety, we'll be able to improve productivity, and we're going to be able to reduce our environmental impacts. Um, and, and really sort of drive this change uh, to give a sort of flavor of the different kind of bits that make it up. You know, the, the infographic on the right has autonomous excavation, which knows the digging work that needs to be done. It knows it has a digital design that's been sent to it uh, wirelessly, and it tracks against that design what it has done. Combined with that, you've got on continuous monitoring of the site through some kind of drone. It's linked to uh, autonomous it's linked to something like a dump truck or you know, very difficult to, to move the material around and it's tracking that so as it's piling up as it's offloading you've got a continuous supply and you know the movement of your materials throughout and then there's the sort of safety element where your workers are, can be protected in a sort of combination of of digital and um, vision based ways and, and sort of create a something that controls that people plant interface so just uh, drill down a bit more into how this sort of flows through you start out with your digital designs your your bin uh, information model which contains all of the information you need to to do your construction to complete set of your designs and it's tracked for a connected site to to really function we're saying that this needs to be moved towards a design for machines element so that the designs the digital designs that are created are compatible with the machine being able to read them and interpret them as a continuous set of instructions for it to implement it and so at no point should a human have to intervene to convert the design that we currently create for a really human-centric approach um, to be suitable for a for a machine to to execute that data is transferred across to the machine it starts to implement or 
depending on the level of automation that's that's there, uh, it might provide guidance or support to a human operator to carry it out. While it's doing that, it's tracking the exact uh, as built information and is feeding that on to both a, a sort of productivity and continuous monitoring piece, which uh, supports the quality assurance and sort of the handover piece, but also gives you the, the information you need to create a digital twin um, and and that have that as a legacy asset that goes forward into your into your maintenance and operations. Simultaneously, we want to have some way of communicating the designs to on-site workers that's better than paper drawings, better than looking at a PDF on a on a tablet. And augmented reality and mixed reality technologies really allow for this direct visualization of the designs in the environment that they're supposed to be used. Um, this has been implemented and allows for you know two-way communication where workers on the ground can call up the designers, overlay the overlay the design in the real-world environment and report the snags and, and work through a solution that can be updated in both ends and implemented and speed up the process. Um, simultaneously, you've got this continuous tracking um, of what you're doing through the drone, um, the drone monitoring, the drone surveying, which again lets you build up this 3D picture that evolves as you go through the project lifecycle. Yep, uh, and then just as a, a bit more of a detailed example, if we talk about an excavation job um, where we're, we're cutting a trench or we're, we're grading a, a slope or whatever it might be, if you have a design for machines tool that allows, that is implementable by a machine, it can be communicated wirelessly across, the machine starts to implement it, knows exactly what it's done, that means that you're avoiding rework. You've got improved accuracy of delivery. You're not having to, you're not digging in places that you shouldn't be and having to mitigate against environmental impacts. So you're speeding up your delivery. You're speeding up the, the process by which you carry out your construction. Simultaneously, you're getting that real world information that lets you go forward. Um, you've got a, a capture of the, what you've actually done, which supports your, Quality assurance, it supports your handover, it helps you with your contracts. If you have to, um, if you get in and come to dispute, you know exactly what's been done and you can point to it and have that digital record. Uh, and then use that, build on that information as you go forward into your, as the, the client goes forward into their maintenance and operation phase. Uh, I think, James, if we have some examples. Yeah, thanks, Cormac. So I'll talk through three different um, case studies of where we've been able to uh, introduce and deliver elements of the of the connected site. So, so all of these case studies are taken from our work within the Smart Motorways Program Alliance, which which Tom introduced earlier. Um, so as Tom mentioned at, at the start, the alliance really is quite sort of um, transformational in its vision for for this sort of thing. So um, by bringing together six different organizations across design and construction with a very long time scale in which to work in over 10 years with a, a large work bank to, to work through over that period of time cost adding up to multiple billions of pounds um, it really did allow a lot of freedom to work in this space and a bit of headroom really to, to make some real change um, so the, the alliance sort of came to us with with a blank bit of paper really recognizing that they wanted to do something within this space within the MMC and the digital transformation on site space but without sort of dictating exactly which types of solution they wanted to implement so it was up for us to to sort of work that out um, so, so the first case study is really around this strategic piece of taking everything that's available in the market in terms of digital solutions and tools and understanding precisely which ones we wanted to take forward to deliver within Within our program of works. Um, so from doing that, it's, it's quite a, a complex task in one, doing a lot of market research. So understanding the, the, the solutions and the suppliers that can help um, resolve some issues, um, but focusing more so on, on the problems themselves. So looking really in detail, talking across partners across the alliance to really understand what the key problems uh, were that they wanted to solve through introducing elements of the connected site 
and from that deriving what the most appropriate solutions would be within this space that we could apply to address them. Um, so taken from that, we built out a, a strategy document which worked through a number of different solutions that we could implement, assess them based on a number of different factors, such as the maturity of the technology and whether that aligned with the time scales of the alliance, um, bit of a value for money assessment, which a business case can be built out from that. Um, and also understanding whether they really did address the critical problems that, that we were seeing on site and how easy or difficult they would be to implement based on the sort of change management perspective. Um, from that, we also then built out a delivery plan. So once we've decided which specific technologies we wanted to introduce, then understanding how do we go about taking one of those and, and introducing it and rolling it out across, across numerous different schemes. So working through a fairly robust delivery model of trialing and piloting the technologies when, when that was required, if it, if, it, if it was new to the highways industry or new to the environment that we were looking to introduce it. Um, taking it through a development approach, monitoring the outputs of whether it was actually doing what we want it to do within those trials and pilots, through to delivering a, uh, a deployment plan to really take those elements of best practice and lessons learned from trials and pilots to then how do we turn this into a business as usual practice, if, if that was the right thing to do for, for that type of technology. Um, so by doing that really sort of top down strategic level piece, it gave us really real clarity in, in what we were going to deliver and how we were going to deliver it, um, which enabled us to communicate with, with decision makers and the client organization to secure some funding to be able to, to press on and actually deliver some elements of this. Um, could you click on to the next slide, please? So I'll talk through a, a couple of different um, examples of where we've delivered parts of the connected site. So that the first one is around a plant telematics solution. So start, starting with the problem, the challenge that we had was, although a lot of the machinery that was used on site did give good information on idling, um, idling being machines um, not working and, and burning fuel um, without actually doing anything in terms of active construction, um, it, the, the level of data that we were getting wasn't great. Idling is a huge issue across the construction industry where we're wasting a, a lot of fuel, which obviously has very negative environmental impacts and also harms productivity on site um, and the ability to deliver on time and on budget. Um, so the issue is we, we, the data that we were getting from the, the existing machines on site wasn't really granular enough to, to make any decisions off to reduce the idling. You get an idea of the overall level of idling across the machine fleet, but weren't really able to drill into it specifically to understand why operators were, were idling the machines. So we teamed up with a, a supplier called Machine Max who have a, a, a sensor solution which you retrofit to each of the machines. It's a magnetic sensor which fits on the next to the engine bay. Um, and that allows to give really, really detailed data on the idling behaviors of, of that machine. So you're able to drill down through two GPS locations of when and where individual operators were, were idling on site. And from understanding that information, we were able to take a trial, expand it to a much bigger pilot, apply it to lots more machines across, across the site, and really drill down into the data and get under the skin of why these operators were, were idling at such a high level. Um, conscious that the idling was fairly high on this scheme, but it's a, it's a construction and a highways industry-wide problem in the UK at least. Um, so for, from doing that and taking the data and analyzing it and presenting it back to the site teams and working with the, the supervisors on site to understand then how we'd go about implementing that change, um, we're able to see some really good reductions in the idling, over 30% idling across a, a few months within the, within the pilot period, um, hundreds of hours reduced. Um, which has then got knock on massive savings from, a, from an emissions point of view. Um, so the, the, probably one of the key takeaways from, from this example is that implementing the technology solution was fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, the more complex bit was the behavioral change piece and the change management. We recognized from an early stage that just introducing the technology solution wouldn't actually result in any positive change. What just by getting access to the data, you don't actually save any money. You, you have to then go out and do something to, to reduce the behaviors on the site. So we teamed up with a, um, with a with a behavioral change expert who then workshops with the operators in a room to say, how do we go about reducing this beyond just 
telling you that yeah, the, the idling is too high. So I think one of the sort of key takeaways from this is recognizing that it's, it's more than just a drop a solution onto a scheme and hope for the best. It's, it's, it requires a lot more deeper understanding of, of what's going on to enable it to be successful. Um, down to the next slide, please, Cormac. And the, yeah, so the second example is um, around remote engineering assistance. So the challenge that we had a lot on, that we came up a lot on a lot of schemes is access to specialist um, assistance while out on site, and that being a, a cause of delay and um, slowing down works and driving costs up. Um, so we teamed up with a supplier called Into Reality who got funding from Microsoft to introduce their um, HoloLens device onto site. So what that, this allows you to do is if a person on site is, for example, commissioning a roadside technology site and they need to go through the commissioning exercise and the person on the other end of the, the phone traditionally needs to be able to see multiple different elements of the site at the same time as the person who's commissioning the site. Um, instead of them coming out at a later date and driving to site, at the expense of the travel and accommodation costs, the on-site engineer would be able to dial in the expert support directly from site so they'd be able to see and hear and walk through with the person out on site commissioning the site to be able to get that done much, much more efficiently. Um, so we, we've undertaken a few trials and pilots of, of this on the M6 in, um, in, in the Northwest of the UK. Um, the, Challenges, I guess, with rolling this out are very different to the telematic solution. This one was a lot more immature as a solution and it had a lot more sort of knock on effects. So there was a critical sort of safety assessment and a safety risk element that had to be considered with wearing this sort of uh, fairly large headset in a roadside environment. So we had to do some very thorough risk assessments to make sure that that was safe to, to do so, um, making sure it's compliant with the protective equipment. So as you can see on the image on screen, the headset had to be compliant with the different eyewear and the different hard hats that the, the team were wearing out on site. And then also understanding the business case is a little bit more tricky for this because the baseline data that we were working with was, was a lot less clear on, on the existing situation and the existing cost of the, of the impact. Um, so yeah, we've, we've been able to see some really good, really good results from this, reducing the number of visits to sites, the amount of aborted site visits that weren't able to be completed previously because they didn't have access to the expertise, they've all been reduced massively. Um, and there's also some, some sort of secondary benefits from the less the uh, reduced use of site vehicles traveling around site, which has some environmental benefits as well. Uh, I'll hand back over to Tom to wrap up. Okay, thanks very much, James. Um, so just bringing it all back together in, in terms of a summary. So um global construction sector has been has been left behind in in productivity terms over the years compared to similar industries um, and it's really now that we need to take the opportunity to do something different um, and digital offers us that opportunity digital transformation modern methods of construction um, and really driving forward addressing the challenges like james says so mitigating those challenges driving the improvements will really make the biggest um, change. Connected site forms part of that vision uh, and really is an opportunity to transform construction through innovation. Um, and as Cormac mentioned, it's across people, plant, processes, materials, the whole site um, can be targeted through this connected site um, toolbox. Um, we've delivered this within the UK and we're seeing really positive results coming from it. Um, and it does give us an opportunity to transform construction and really drive that safer, smoother and greener future for the sector. Um, so thank you very much for your time, everybody. And just open up now for any questions. Thank you, Tim, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, just mentioning quickly the housekeeping items again. Uh, the presentation slides are available to download in the handout box on the GoToWebinar control panel, and you can continue to log your questions in the question box for this session. Thanks. Uh, it will be great to see you guys if you can open your camera. Um, I will start with the first question. Are there any limits to where a con connected site can be applied, for example, sector or ge geography? Um, I'll take this one. Um, 
No, not really. Um, I think one of the, the real powerful points of, of, of this is that it's um, applicable to any sector. It's applicable to any type of construction that you undertake. And it's really like James said about identifying the challenges, matching the um, appropriate innovation, new technology, um, making better use of data in particular areas to address those challenges. So um, no limits. It's uh, it, it's it's a, a solution that sort of delivers against common problems across the globe um, and also across the different types of construction environments that we see. Thank you. Next question is, what does the future look like for connected and automated plants? Yeah, I'll take this. Um, so I think if we if we look at what's happening in calves, we can see that it's going to there'll be a lot of parallels to draw. Um, but we need to be really cognizant of the fact that construction happens in a much more complicated environment than calves drive on roads. It's it's much harder. The where they're operating is much more variable. You need to be basically construction happens in an environment which isn't designed for construction to happen in, whereas roads drive roads are designed for cars to be there or vehicles to be there and that opens up a huge range of problems so it's going to be a much slower and a much more iterative journey i think than than the one the calves are experiencing um where we've now got a lot of plant that is coming with sort of operator assistance technology you could call them things like 3d mission control or or geofencing things that prevent some elements of the construction aspect from they remove some element of the construction job from the operator. There's still a lot of reliance on the operator in there. And I think we're just going to have to iterate through that, evolve up in more and more tasks getting handed over from the operator to the to the plant. But it's a slow iterative, iterative journey. Uh, and it's going to start with the simplest types of construction. So things like excavation or compaction, there's a lot of progress already being made in those whereas more complicated uh, pieces of construction, assembly of, of multiple objects and things like that, automation isn't as, as focused there. And that's where the, the offsite assembly uh, really benefits uh, things. So it's a, it, that's where ConnectSite sort of integrates with the, the wider MMC piece. Um, so I think it's a slow iterative journey. Uh, we may in the, in the sort of 10, 15, 20 years see fully automated construction equipment going on, but I, I wouldn't, expect that to be rolled out in wide-scale use anytime soon. Thank you. Um, is connected site an isolated solution or does it interact with design operation and maintenance phases of the project life cycle? I'll take that as well. Um, so if you, if you start with sort of the simplest approach, yes it's all connected because there's a continuous thread of data that runs throughout the project lifecycle. So obviously you've got a digital design in the design phase and that gets fed through into the connected site where it's implemented. Uh, and then the connected site sort of feeds back and creates an updated as built design that goes on to a digital twin or, or whatever it is for design uh, for maintenance and operation, operation and maintenance. Um, but you get more links, more feedback between them as well. So when you introduce automated plant, you might be able to do a design which humans can't really implement or you know the use of mmc lets you do a design that you wouldn't be able to do uh, with traditional construction machine uh, con traditional construction methods um, and so there's a sort of two-way communication between those uh, and then when you go to the design for when you go to the maintenance and operation obviously if it's a new construction site any kind of construction site you can apply the connected site stuff onto as, as tom said so that applies equally to maintenance and renewals as it does to a greenfield brand new new build so i would say that those are the big links uh, and then the final bit i think to mention is obviously pieces of the technology can get transferred across so if you've got something like uh, a drone survey is a big piece of connected site where you, you do these continuous drone surveys Obviously, if you want to do those to write your project lifecycle or sorry, your asset lifecycle look, provide you with a continuous or periodic updating of, of your asset condition as well. Thank you.
the next question is uh, some comments and questions together. I will read it as is. Uh, as you identified, isn't the issue more behavioral rather than technological? And how do you solve that? Especially as the need to change is more seen as an office issue instead of a site issue. I'll pick that one up. Um, yeah, so, so the, uh, the bit around the behavioral change and how do you solve that? Um, we were very quick to recognize that as people with, with the jobs that we've got in terms of introducing the technology and coming from a, the expertise in the digital and the connected environment, we shouldn't be the ones that are dictating to those on site how to change their behaviors. That's not one, we have the expertise to do that and two, it's not, it's not the right thing to, for us to be able to sort of telling them to do that. Um, so we left that very much up to the, the work superintendent on the site to manage the messages and the, the information that we gave them to be able to make an informed decision on how to enact some behavioral change. Um, I think they used a, a new, a, a number of different ways of doing that. I think they incentivized um, low idling figures in some cases. So using like a league table approach to say all 20 operators on the site, whoever gets the, lead, the lowest level of idling gets a, um, a gift card or, or something like that. Um, but the bit around the, the, what the data enabled them to do was by seeing specifically which machines were idling at the highest level and when they're idling, it allowed the work superintendent to have those targeted conversations with those that were wasting the most fuel. Um, how they went about doing that, it would left very, very much up to them to have those conversations because that's that's their expertise, that's their domain to be able to have those conversations and to enact the change. Um, we weren't privy to them a lot of the time, so um, we kind of left it up to them to 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 do what they need to do to to get the behaviours right, which they managed to do successfully. Thank you. I would take the last question. What were the main challenges associated with trialing and piloting connected site technologies? Yeah, I'll take that one as well. Um, so I think there's many challenges is the short answer. Um, I think introducing anything new is always going to be difficult, um, more from the entering the unknown element, I guess. Um, no matter how much you plan and prepare for introducing something new, there's always stuff that's going to come up that's going to throw a spanner in the works or something that you didn't foresee happening. So I think a lot of it's about being being agile and being receptive to those to those changes and those challenges as they come at you, recognizing that it's not going to be perfect in terms of a solution. That's the reason for doing a trial or a pilot is to figure out all the stuff that doesn't quite go right, all the stuff that needs to be considered for a smoother, more widespread rollout. Um, I think logistically, there's there's a lot of challenges and, and just the practicality of doing, introducing things to a site that wasn't previously there. Um, a lot of the sites that we worked in when we were doing these pilots were um in very very busy stages of the of the project so trying to get the time of the right people at the right time to be able to for example install the sensors um manage the movement of sensors when the plant was getting off hired versus when new machines were coming on site um keeping on top of all those logis logistical challenges as a particular as a particular challenge that um that we learned from from this um and yeah i think i think one of the other ones is the bit to be able to do a business case there's always a conflict with with business cases because you're trying to project a lot of the potential benefits in the future for a lot of the technologies that we looked at and the trials and pilots to be able to secure funding it's very difficult to do so because the there often isn't the baseline information to be able to say it currently costs this amount to do this job using this technology or this process we think we can improve it by using this technology if they don't baseline the current level of performance, it's very hard to then say, oh, we're going to improve that by 10%. And then what does 10% therefore look like to be able to justify someone to spend some money to do it? Um, that's a constant challenge, I think, with a lot of innovation, especially in the construction sector. But um, yeah, definitely one that we, we found when doing some trials and pilots in the Alliance. Fantastic. Thanks again, uh, Tim, for a fantastic presentation. Really interesting, these uh, three case studies. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We hope to see you in our upcoming sessions. And please feel free to follow up directly with the presenters via the contact details shown on the screen.
So I wish everyone a wonderful day. We will wrap up the session now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.